Elizabethan Prose Elizabethan Prose Introduction, the Elizabethan Age has well been called a young age. It was full of boundless vigor, reawakened intellectual earnestness, and unfettered, soaring imagination. The best fruits of the age are enshrined in poetry in which all these elements can be befittingly contained. In poetry there are restrictions of versification which exerted some check on the youthful imagination and vigor of the Elizabethans. Consequently, Elizabethan poetry is very great, but prose does not admit of any restrictions, and the result is that Elizabethan prose is as one run amok. Too much of liberty has taken away much of its merit. During the 15th century, Latin was the medium of expression, and almost all the important prose works were written in that language. It was in the 16th century, particularly in its later half, that the English language came to its own. With the arrival of cheap mass printing English prose became the popular medium for women both at amusement and in the books which date from this period cover many departments of learning. We have the chronicles of such writers as Stowe and Holinshed recapturing the history of England, though mixed with legends and myths. Writers like Harrison and Stubbs took upon themselves the task of describing the England not of the past but of their own age. Many writers, most of them anonymous, wrote accounts of their voyages which had carried them to many hitherto unknown lands in and across the western seas. Then, there are so many novelists who translated Italian stories and wrote stories of their own after the Italian models. There are also quite a few writers who wrote on religion. And last of all there is a host of pamphleteers who dealt with issues of temporary interest. Though the prose used by these numerous writers is not exactly similar, yet we come across a basic characteristic common to the, the, the nearness of their prose to poetry. The H says G. H. Mare was intoxicated with language. It went mad of a mere delight in words. Its writers were using a new tongue, for English was enriched beyond all recognition with borrowings from the ancient authors, and like all artists who become possessed of a new medium, they used it to excess. The early Elizabethans' use of the new prose was very like the use some educated Indians make of English. It was rich, gaudy and overflowing, though, in the main, correct. A. C. Ward observes an illustrated history of English literature, volume. I. Our modern view of prose is strictly and perhaps too narrowly practical and utilitarian or functional. Prose, we hold, has a job to do and should do it without fuss, nonsense, or aesthetic capers. It should say what it has to say in the shortest and most time-saving manner, and their finish. But we find Elizabethan prose far from this commonly accepted principle. rhythmic, indirect, prolix, and convoluted. Rarely does an Elizabethan prose writer call a spade a spade. The prose works of the Elizabethan age fall into two categories, I fiction e non-fiction. Let us consider them one by one. Fiction The fiction of the age of Elizabeth is generally romantic in nature in the sense that it is of the kind of romance. Many forms of fiction were practiced in the age. Some important forms and their practitioners are as follows, I the romances of Lily Green, and La G the pastoral romance of Sir Philip Sidney E the picaresque novel of Nash I V the realistic novel of Delony. John Lily 1554-1606, Lily in his romance displays all the peculiarities of Elizabethan prose which we have mentioned above. At the age of 24 he came out with his Euphus or the anatomy of wit 1578 which took England by storm. This work which may only very roughly be termed the first English prose novel was an agglomeration of a thousand elements many of them alien to the nature of the novel proper. The plot of the work is the simplest imaginable. Euphus is a man of learning and culture belonging to Athens which evidently stands for Oxford. He goes to Naples which stands for London to lead a life of pleasure. There he becomes intimate friends with a young man Philotus who introduces him to his fiancée, Lucilla. Euphus attracts Lucilla's love, and the two friends exchange taunting letters. But Lucilla plays him false and elopes with a stranger. Euphus, heartbroken, returns to Athens, and he and Philotus become friends again. The plot is simple but very long essays on such topics as love and the education of children, with many rhetorical letters and lengthy dialogues, are grafted onto the thin
In 1580 LVLV came out with a sequel, Yufuzin. His England, in which is narrated the arrival of Balatus and Yufuz in England, and Balatus' unsuccessful courtship of Camilla, a maid of honor to Queen Elizabeth. This volume pays a glowing tribute to the English nobility, particularly the courtiers. Lily was, to quote Tucker Brook, most careful to depict them, not as they were, but as they would have liked to have themselves regarded. To quote the same critic, in the last 15 pages a portrait of Queen Elizabeth is probably the most elaborately flattering that much flattered sovereign ever received. What is remarkable about Lily's work is not its matter but its terribly manieristic prose style which has come to be dubbed as Euphuism. It came to be parodied and derided by a long chain of writers from Shakespeare to Scott though it also excited imitation in a very large number of writers now justly forgotten. The cool Drayden declared that Lily taught his Count Rimilo speak and write all like mere lunatics. Nevertheless, if Lily was a lunatic there was method in his madness. He did employ a well-thought-out plan which has the following characteristics. I the first is the principle of symmetry and equipoise obtained generally by the employment of alliteration, balance, an expression as hot liver of a heedless lover, or the description of Yufus as a young gallant of more wit than wealth, yet of more wealth than wisdom. E. Secondly, there are the very numerous references to the classical authorities, even for very well-known facts. E. Thirdly, there is the mass of allusions to natural history, generally of the fabulous kind. All these devices are used for the purpose of decoration. But our complaint is that the style is over-decorated, to the point of being monotonous and insipid, even though it affects poetic beauties. To quote Compton Rickett, Lilias style the distinction between prose and verse those of an age that found its most effective medium in verse. Robert Green, 1560 92. Green was a patent imitator of Lily, and later that of Sidney, after he came to know of his Arcadia. Though in his actual life he was a debauchee of the worst kind, yet in his works he was quite didactic. His several novels include Pandosto 1588, which very obviously furnished the plot for Shakespeare's essay Winter's Tale. His other important works are Menefin 1519, Mamelia 1583, and The Card. A fancy which was published within a decade of Yufus and as a C. Ward says, reproduces its mannerisms of style, its elaborately artificial and voluble conversations, its classical embellishments, its images and comparisons from natural history for Green, like Lily, drew upon Pliny, its frequent and lengthy soliloquies. The frequency of letters may have furnished Richardson with a model of epistolary novel. In his life and death of Ned Brown, a notorious pickpocket, Green provides hints for the low life scenes we meet with in the novels of Smollett and Defoe. Thomas Lodge 1558-1625, he was another writer of uphaustic novels the best of which is Rosalind, Yufu's Golden Legacy 1590. In his tricks of style Lodge imitates Lily, but his manner is derived from Greek pastoral romance. The work is significant because it furnished Shakespeare with the plot of As You Like It. Further, it includes, like Green S. Sir Philip Sidney 1554, like Lyle, also prompted a number of imitators. His Arcadia 1590 is the first pastoral romance in English prose, just as Spencer S. The Shepherd S. Calendar is the first verse pastoral romance. All the happenings of the story are envisaged in an imaginary land of idyllic beauty with shepherds, shepherdesses, running brooks, and lush scenery. It tells the story of Basilius, king of Arcadia, who settles in a village with his wife and two daughters named Pamela and Philoclea. 2. Princes from abroad come to Arcadia and start courting the two girls. One disguises himself as a shepherd and the other as an Amazon. Complications start when both Basilius and his wife fall in love with the Amazon, the former taking him to be a real Amazon and the latter, after discovering his real identity. Everything is finally unraveled by Euarchus, king of Macedonia and father 6F, one of the princes. Everything ends happily. This was the first version of the Arcadia, known as the Old Arcadia. In 
The revised version Sydney included many complications and also added much symbolism and didacticism which rendered it almost of the nature of the Fairy Queen. In the Arcadia, observes Deitches, ideal love, ideal friendship, and the ideal ruler are, directly and indirectly, discussed, suggested, and embodied. The style of the Arcadia is as artificial and attitudinized as that of Yufu's. It is, to quote Deitches again, highly conceited, full of elaborate analogies, balanced. Parenthetical clauses and other devices of an immature prose entering suddenly into the world of conscious literary artifice. One of Sidney S. constant devices is to take a word and, somewhat like Shakespeare, toss it about till its meaning is sucked dry. As an example of pathetic fallacy consider his reference to the cool wine which seems to laugh for joy as it nears a lady's lips. Similarly the water drops that slip down the bodies of dainty ladies seem to weep for sorrow. The name that a beautiful lady utters is perfumed by the scent of her breath. When the princesses put on their clothes, the clothes are described as glad. And so forth. Thomas Nash 1567-1601, Nash had a taste for buffoonery, satire, reckless savagism, and effrontery. He is best known for his vigorous pamphlets. He also wrote the first English picaresque novel The Unfortunate Traveler, or The Life of Jack Wilton 1594 which is a tale of the adventures of a page named Wilton in the reign of Henry VIII. It was perhaps suggested by the Spanish Lozarillo de Thorms. It has also been called the first English historical novel as it introduces as characters suck H known figures of yore as Erasmus, Sir Thomas More, and the Earl of Surrey. But Nash jumbles up all the historical details with reckless abandon and irreverent anachronisms. The adventures of Jack Wilton take him through half of Europe which, particularly Italy, is described with all its sordidness, crime, culture, and beauty. The novel has no form. It is made up of, to quote Compton Rickett, a series of episodes lightly strung together. It is hopelessly incoherent at times. In his prose style Nash follows neither Lily nor Green nor Sidney. His sentences are short and striking, but sometimes he is carried away by a flood of words. Nash, says A. C. Ward, was drunk with words, even besotted by them. Anyway, his strength was acknowledged by his contemporaries, and he had many imitators. Thomas Delany 1543-1600, Delany, a silk weaver by profession, exhibited even weaker sense of form and structure than Cauchet. His three tales Jack of Nubui, The Gentle Craft, and Thomas of Reading all 1590 show him as a storyteller of the bourgeois craftsman. In the second named he glorifies the craft of shoemakers. Delany's style is quite homely, and he was read and appreciated by a vast number of people. Four seven one six hundred. Hooker's masterly work of the laws of ecclesiastical policy is the greatest of the non-fictional prose works of the Elizabethan age. It began appearing volume by volume in 1590, continued till the author's death. It was the first book in England which used English for a serious philosophic discussion. Hooker was a Protestant who combined the piety of a saint with the simplicity of a child. His purpose in writing the book was to defend the Church of England and to support certain principles of church government. Hardin Craig in A History of English Literature edited by himself maintains, as originally written the eight books were already on a very high level of theological and legal argument. The first book is Hooker's famous general treatise on law. The second argues that divine law or scripture is not the only law that ought to serve for our direction in things ecclesiastical. The effect of the third is to make of the church an independent and self-directed institution within the state. The fourth claims for the church the right to adjust its position, free, on the one side, of Rome and, on the other, of Geneva. The fifth book deals with the established practices of the Church of England. The fragmentary sixth is largely on penitence. 
The seventh treats the power and position of bishops, and the eighth is a most significant treatise on the relation of the church to the secular government. Hooker admits the right of the secular government to establish and control the church, but declares that the powers of the crown are derived from the consent of the governed and expressed in a parliament of the people. Hooker modeled his style on Cicero. Though his diction is simple yet the syntax is highly Latinized but not without much harmony and studied flow. The style is as much removed from vulgarity as from pedantry. Ruskin was later to seize upon this style and use it in his earlier works, particularly modern painters. Bacon 1561-1626, exactly opposite to Hooker. Cooper anti-Ciceronian style. Much of what Bacon wrote appeared in the age of James I. However, the first edition of his essays appeared in 1597, that is, within the age of Elizabeth. Bacon borrowed the term and the conception of the essay from the French writer Montaigne whose essay first appeared in 1580. In spite of the fact that Bacon took them lightly, his essays make pretty heavy reading. They are full of memorable aphorisms which have passed into everyday speech. The scope of his essays is vast, and they embrace all kinds of issues, but mostly, those of practical life. By writing his essays Bacon became the father of the English essay. Even though his essays differ from the kind which was later established in England, he is a worthy predecessor of the line of essayists ranging from his own times up to ours.